Ronstadt with the City of Joplin, and I welcome you to Joplin Insider, a show designed to give you an inside look to Joplin City Hall and some of the programs and services we offer at the city. Today my guests are Dan Pickerick and Martin White, both with the Health Department. Dan's the Director of the Health Department, and Martin is, the, is an Animal Control Officer. Um, animal Control is just one of the divisions of the Health Department, but we're going to focus on that area specifically today. Welcome to you both. Thanks for Thank you. having us. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, we're going to try to help our viewers understand a little bit more about animal control and how you work with uh, the city's um, citizens and keeping mm -hmm. our environment safe as well as um, our animals safe, so mm -hmm. to speak, with some of the ordinances work you do. Um, just to launch it right off, Dan, I'd like to ask you to share with our viewers just a basic overview of animal control and okay. its role. Sure. Well, as you mentioned, you know, animal control is one of the of several divisions uh, mm -hmm. in the department. Uh, it's probably a little bit more unique than most. Most people don't think of animal control when they think of health department. You think mm -hmm. of you know school shots for kids and inspecting restaurants for safety. And but it's, it is one a little bit uh, that's maybe a little bit more unique than others. Um, it is a program that uh, some of our program areas uh, most are inside the city limits, and some actually go outside the city limits. But this is one that is just within the corporate city limits of the city. Uh, and that's because our ordinances are only, you know, only mm -hmm. enforceable within the city limits. So it, it is a program that is limited to the city limits of Joplin. Um, we do get a call, a lot of calls from outside the city. Uh, uh, we, you know, it's not unusual during the course of the day to get several calls from people. So how do you handle those? Well, uh, we try to, if there is an animal control program in those areas, we try to keep up on, uh, on that information and we try to refer those individuals to those programs. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of areas uh, that are around the city that just don't have any animal control program. So that, that does really leave a gap for those individuals on, you know, what do I do mm -hmm. if there's a, a pack of dogs running down my street? So. Mm -hmm. It is a challenge, uh, but we are limited to that, to, 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 to the city limits of, of Joplin. Uh, again, we'll refer to those uh, other programs if we know about them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we are, are a little bit unique also in the fact that we don't operate our own city shelter. A lot of times when you think of uh, animal control, you think of the city pound. Yeah, you know? right, right. Uh, and, and many years, actually many years ago, there was a city pound uh, back in the early 1970s. But since mm -hmm. then, we've not had our own shelter or, or, or our own pound, if you will. Uh, we contract with the Humane Society uh, here uh, mm -hmm. in the area, on North Main, uh, for the sheltering services. So we actually provide, we answer the calls, mm -hmm. uh, we dispatch the animal control officers. Uh, they take care of the uh, of picking up the animals or dealing with the issues, enforce the ordinances, what have you. And then, if but if we do have to uh, pick up an animal, we uh, shelter it at the Humane Society. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is a program that is primarily complaint driven. It's not a program that we we just don't have the time to just patrol right. neighborhoods. That's just not a, a well, luxury. Well, they're a pretty big city, actually. Yeah, and we only have three animal control officers to patrol the entire you know. And, and not all of them are working clubs. at the same time. Right. right. So it's it's very it's very um, challenging uh, sometimes to get to every, all the calls on time mm -hmm. and, and as quickly as we would like to. But uh, it is a complaint driven program. So as a call comes in, we dispatch the animal control officers and uh, uh, to the to the problem area. It is, it's a lot of times it's very helpful to us if mm -hmm. people will give us the exact address. Mm -hmm. um, if they're calling in and saying there's a dog running loose down, you know, or, or the problem is that in, in, in a certain block or a certain mm -hmm. neighborhood, or if you can limit it down and give us that exact address the right. best you can, that really helps us to be able to dispatch somebody to, uh, to the, uh, in a timely fashion. Well, I know I've had to call at different times. If I've seen a dog, I'll call mm -hmm. and I've learned, you're exactly right, that you know I'm west of Schifferdecker or east of this or mm -hmm. you know west, north, south. Give a general direction of where you are and which way the dog's heading. Yeah, you and can pay attention to and that. If, if you know yeah. where the address is, where the animal is at, or the problem is coming from, mm -hmm. uh, it's really helpful to us to know that address. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise you could be circling. Sure. Well, I know a lot of the work you do is in accordance with the uh, animal control ordinances that mm -hmm. are in our city code. Um, provide, can you give us some details about these ordinances? Okay. Well, Martin could speak to volumes to, my, to me, yes. and, and I'll, I'll kind of cover some of the areas, oh, yeah. and you may want to cover some of them. But, uh, it, you know, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's an ordinance that's pretty consistent with most of the animal control ordinances of communities that we tend to, to look at as benchmark our programs against other programs. So it's very, very consistent with those. I'm going to interrupt real quickly. And just I think if we could call that up on the screen. There sure. you go. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, a website that people can go to. Um, it's at Joplin Mo, no, Joplin Health Department. Dot, uh, dot org, mm -hmm. right? Right. And it, it's, it's, con it's, as you can see, it's considered Chapter 18 mm -hmm. of the Joplin City Ordinances. And, and again, you can read anything you want about the animal control ordinances you can find there. 
Some of the things that we deal with most consistently and on a, really on a regular basis, uh, probably the most consistent one is, is the calls that we get are just have to do with dogs running loose. Mm -hmm. uh, so somebody calls in and says, there's a dog, uh, I was just jogging down the street this morning and the dog chased me down the street, you know, yeah. or the dog got into my trash and, and dumped it all over or, or what have you. So dogs running loose is a, is a real problem for us. Uh, we do have a leash law in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, we have forever. <laughs> leash law, uh, dogs, all dogs need to be on a leash when they're out. Is that right? When they're being walked, that is correct. Okay. We might even change the word to restraint law because mm -hmm. we have what's called a no tether law now. And this is very important because you cannot chain or cable your dog in the city for long periods of time. Like you used to be able to do in the past, we mm -hmm. recommend either a secure dog pin or secure fence to hold the dog in. These are more humane and more actually safer to keep the dog restrained than to just basically keep it on a tether. Mm -hmm. Well. And I re uh, thank you, because I remember when we did that just mm -hmm. several years ago, mm -hmm. we started the snow tether. Mm -hmm. And what I understand is it kind of came about because of the dangerous dog. Right. You know, that some cities adopt a dangerous dog breed right. ordinance, which mm -hmm. we have chosen to go to the tethering. Correct. Can you tell us the difference or why tethering versus dangerous dog? Well, again, uh, Martin kind of covered some of it. Um, when we did that research back mm -hmm. in 2010 at the, at the request of the city council, um, uh, it was evident from the research that, I mean, the more you tether an animal, the longer an animal is tethered, that's the world that they know. Just mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're staked to that mm -hmm. post or they're on a, on a run. That's the world they know. It makes them, uh, I guess, meaner. More aggressive. More aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, 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 as opposed to being in an, an a fenced yard or mm -hmm. in a fenced pen. And if they're in a fenced pen, you know, obviously it's going to be a smaller area. Right. In addition to that, you need to obviously take the dog out of the pen and take it for walks on a regular mm -hmm. basis. But if it's on that, it's, it's on that leash, it tends to make it more aggressive over time. Uh, leashes do fail. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, tethers do fail, mm -hmm. uh, and we've seen that many times. Tethers get tangled, no matter how mm -hmm. much you try to not have that happen. I, I can't tell you how many times Martin has probably seen over the, over the years where he's found dogs that have hanged themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on just kind of gotten wrapped around. Exactly. Wrapped around, jumps over fence, uh, gets into debris, and then. Yeah. They can't get out. Yeah. And, yeah. So yeah. that that you're right. That that tether ordinance came out of that discussion about do we want to ban breeds or mm -hmm. not? And and it, one of the things we found out was, you know, in communities where they don't allow tethering, you do you do tend to see a drop in the number of animal control or, or do, dogs being loose, mm -hmm. uh, running at large calls, and also just the aggressive aggressive calls or, and dangerous dog type calls. Yeah, because that makes sense. Like you said, the tethers break, or mm -hmm. they they break, or mm -hmm. like you said, it could be a tragedy for the family sure. pet as well. So what other kind of ordinances do we have other than the dogs? Well, one of the uh, very common ones, as a matter of fact, we were just talking about this this morning in the office, uh, you know, you're required to have rabies vaccinations up to date on your dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. uh, you're also required to have license in the city. Uh, now, the license is free forever in Joplin if the animal is altered, if it's spay or neutered. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, that hopefully encourages individuals to get their animals uh, spay or neutered. Uh, but it, there is a, a rabies vaccination requirement, and that's for obvious reasons. Right. Uh, this part of the country, especially this time, uh, this, this part of the uh, year, uh, spring and into summer, uh, rabies is out there. I mean, people don't realize it, but it's, it's, it's not uncommon at all to see rabies in the wild animal populations in the area. Mm -hmm. And all it takes is, uh, you know, if your dog's out in the yard and you're not with it and it gets into a, a tussle with a, a rabid skunk mm -hmm. or a raccoon, mm -hmm. uh, and all there has to do is just be a little bit of a transfer yeah. of fluids from that animal to your animal, and you can, and your animal can develop rabies. So, uh, rabies uh, vaccination is are, are extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a big one. Um, something the guys deal with all the time is the number of animals. Yeah. A lot of animals. A lot of people feel the need that you know they love animals and they want to have as many as they can. But what we found out is the more animals people have, the less care they can provide those animals. It's just like anything else. The more right. you have, the less you can take care of them. So we have came down to a number in the city of Joplin. That's mm -hmm. four animals per resident. That's either two dogs, two cats, mm -hmm. four dogs, no cats, four mm -hmm. cats, no dogs. Yeah. But four of the dogs and cats mm -hmm. is, is what the city limit is on the number of animals. And that's we, very consistent with other communities around us yeah. as well. Well, I, yeah, I would imagine that that's a lot of animals, really. Well, especially, you know, you look at some of the older neighborhoods in Joplin, mm -hmm. and the lot might be 75 by 150 or something like that, and you have the house there, then you have a very small backyard. So if you have yeah. four dogs, that's pretty much about all the room you can have, you yeah. know, for those animals. But uh, we, um, uh, of course, we talked a little bit about the importance of spay-neuter, but, but uh, 
especially for cats. <laughs> yes. That's, uh, that's an area that uh, we'll talk about a little bit more, but uh, you know, that's, we have a real problem with picking up a large number of uh, either stray or feral cats in this community. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have a cat, if you actually own a cat and mm -hmm. you allow it to be outside at any portion of time uh, without you being present with mm -hmm. it, without it being right. supervised. Yeah, because cats like to prowl. I mean, yeah. they like to get out. The ordinance actually says that if you have a cat, you allow it to be outside without you being present, without being supervised, it has to be altered. It's supposed to be sterilized. So that way, if it jumps the fence and, and mm -hmm. go, goes out and does what it's going to do, yeah. you know, uh, it's not going to be uh, uh, providing litters, you know, right. in the neighborhood. So right. that's a very important code. Um, noisy animals. Oh, gosh, we get calls about dogs dogs barking. Uh, How do you document that? Because obviously you're not there, and you know, by the time you get there, the dog may not be barking. Well, most of the time, like I said, we get citizens call into complaints. Mm -hmm. We can contact them. And a lot of times we go over there, the dog is still barking. Ah. And that's one thing unique about our, our noisy animal ordinance is it's just not from 10 at night till 7 in the morning mm -hmm. like some of the other city noise ordinances are. This is 24-7 because we have to take into consideration there's a lot of people that work at the hospitals mm -hmm. and in other locations where they work all night and have mm -hmm. to sleep all day. Right. So we have to take their concerns and, and basically look at what they need, their mm -hmm. needs, as far as keeping the neighbor's dogs quiet mm -hmm. or other animals. We've had complaints on birds. Um, we had complaints on other animals that, mm -hmm. that you wouldn't normally situate with a, a noisy mm -hmm. or barking dog. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it does go down to a lot of barking dogs. Huh. So how do you, do you just, what is creating the barking? You have to eliminate that, I assume, whatever it is. If Most of the barking that we find is activity. You know, your uh -huh. dog's in the backyard. It sees somebody walking by, and it, it just wants to play. It just, uh -huh. it just needs lonely. activity. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. lonely. It just wants somebody there, to, some attention. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other times, it's because the dog's in distress or there's other issues there mm -hmm. that you know, the dog is just trying to say, hey, you know, mm -hmm. I need some help here. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, when we talk to the owners of the dogs, we, we try to find solutions to the problem. Mm -hmm. And there's many solutions. I, one thing we do recommend uh, is, is bark collars. And they're very humane. You can mm -hmm. check with the Humane Society of America. And if they're used properly, they're very effective. But that's what people have to understand when you use one of these products to read the instructions carefully and understand that there's a certain way you have to condition your animal to become accustomed to the bark collar. Mm -hmm. and, and again, when we suggest to these people and they use them, we usually don't get any more complaints. Okay. Well, that sounds like a good way. I'm, you, how long have you been in the field? You've been This is my this? 20th year. I was going to say, so you probably have a lot of good animal stories to tell <laughs> and you've been kept pretty busy through those 20 years. What? <laughs> What are some of the simpler steps pet owners can take to maybe prevent seeing you in the neighborhood? If you don't want to see any animal control officer, there's, there's a few things you need to do is, is keep your dog secured. Mm -hmm. That is the golden rule. And, mm -hmm. and what I tell people is this, everybody that has a dog, they're going to get out eventually. So what I tell people, I, I basically do the same is my dogs all have collars with my cell phone number on there. Mm -hmm. And I, people can tell you that are watching this that I've told them this before is, if you have a dog that gets out and I pick it up or I know about it, mm -hmm. I always tell them you need to get a light colored collar and with a permanent marker, write your cell number on that collar. Nine out of 10 people would rather call you and get your dog back to you than call us. Mm -hmm. But nine out of 10 dogs don't have any identification on them whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So this is a very important step and for cats. I know mm -hmm. it's harder to keep collars on cats because mm -hmm. we can't keep one on ours, but we yeah. keep our cat inside. But it, it, if you put that identification on there, and, and the city does require you have the rabies tag and the city license tag on the collar, mm -hmm. but actually we'd rather see a phone number on there because mm -hmm. we want you to get your dog back without us getting involved. Mm -hmm. You know, We're not here to make money off picking up animals. Mm -hmm. We're here to get animals back to their owners and to make sure the problem doesn't uh, consist. So Right, right. Well, um, you mentioned you know the the money you know as far as we're not here to make money it actually costs for oh, sure. the city to sure. have this kind of service right. um, I mean, the animal control program is uh, a, a growing cost in the health department uh, this year uh, without capital costs include just the operational cost it's about four hundred eighty thousand dollars to run the animal control program for the city and uh, roughly half of that is our contract with the, with the Humane Society here in town for the sheltering services. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so 
and, and a large a large amount of that cost, again, r half of it is that sheltering cost, and most of that is being driven just by the sheer number of animals we take into the Humane Society. Mm -hmm. We're charged on a per animal basis, essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, however many animals we take, it's going to reflect on how big our bill is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so it it is, it, you know, the more animals we have to pick up, uh, and like Martin said, if, if there's a number on that collar and we can call the person and say, hey, we just found your dog, you know, can mm -hmm. we get it back to you or something? That's, that saves that animal from going to the shelter. That saves a cost, an additional cost to mm -hmm. the city, mm -hmm. uh, potentially. As well so, as to the person. Isn't there a fee as well when they have to pick yeah, up? You so, mm -hmm. um, so anyway, uh, you know, that's, just a, that's a huge issue uh, is just keeping those number of animals down because that drives the cost up. Uh, for the program. And again, the Humane Society's not out to make money. I mean, it costs to do these mm -hmm. types of services because of the resources. You know, when you go out to the Humane Society, we go out there when we're picking out a pet. We usually go out to, out there to, to, to look at them and pick one out. <laughs> that they're crammed. I mean, they mm -hmm. have lots sure. and lots of animals sure. there. So yeah. um, what other things can people do to, you know, prevent that pet population? Spay or neutering is mm -hmm. the key factor here. And what you have to understand, an unspayed or unneutered dog or cat is going to be more likely to roam. When we find a, an animal that's been hit and killed on the road, mm -hmm. almost always they're not spayed or they're not neutered. And especially with cats. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have the law in the city of Joplin that any cat outside has to be sterilized. And that's just as much for the, the cat owner as mm -hmm. it is for the neighbor who's complaining about the cat. Mm -hmm. Because the problem here is is when you have an animal that is not spare neutered, it'll roam farther and, and that's when the complaints will come in on it. But but the big thing here is is I think getting an animal spare neutered helps in many different ways besides roaming. It also helps in the animal's health. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you got the reproduction cycle, which cats are very prolific. Whereas you have a dog, a dog unspayed or unneutered dog is not likely to go out and have puppies, but unspayed and unneutered stray cats are very likely to have kittens if they're fed and watered. Mm -hmm. by so I the understand neighbor. they typically do every time they come into season that yeah. go, there's mm -hmm. going to be a litter. Sure. Sure. So I, I've heard of people that say this cat has kittens every time, and mm -hmm. I'm thinking, well, get it spayed. Yeah, no. Hello. And, and multiple so, times a season. Yeah. Now you had mentioned that there's a, a benefit if you get them spayed or neutered on your license. Can you explain that and how that works? Uh, yeah. Uh, in Joplin, um, again, a license is twenty dollars per animal. Mm -hmm. um, but if the animal is altered, is, is spayed or neutered, mm -hmm. then it's uh, free, and it's free forever. So all they have to do is come to the city, because mm -hmm. they come to the finance department to get their license, get the license, and they just need to show the documentation that the animal is spayed or neutered. And, and show that it's had its rabies vaccinations. Right, right. Uh, and then you, and then it, and it, if it's been altered, then it's, it, like I say, it's going to be a free license cost forever. Yeah. You had something to add? Yeah, it's yeah. important also to note that the code also requires that the rabies vaccine be given by a licensed yeah. veterinarian. Ah. It doesn't have to be one within the city of Joplin. It does have to be a licensed veterinarian and it has to be an official mm -hmm. receipt or document mm -hmm. from the veterinarian's office that is signed or stamped by the veterinarian. Also, if your animal is spare neutered, a lot of times you will find that uh, the vet will put that right on that same document, mm -hmm. usually under sex of the animal. It will mm -hmm. say S or N for spare or neutered. Mm -hmm. But if it does not say spare or neutered, then it, even if the animal is, you have to pay the $20 for the city license. So it's very important when you get your animal spare or neutered, make sure that the vet notates that on the rabies mm -hmm. certificate or gives a different document that you can provide to the finance department to prove the animal is spare or neutered. That way you don't have to pay the city license fee, which is due every January. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every year. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can yeah. save yourself a lot of money. Sure, yes. And plus the amount of dog food or cat food you're <laughs> buying as well, because uh, we, we hit that four limit. Now, when you said that, I started adding them up. Okay, we just got a third dog. We have a cat. Oh my gosh. No We're more. I can tell my daughters, no more. We can't. Blame it on us. That's right. I will. I will. I have to have a scapegoat. So this time of year, um, well, all throughout the year, but especially in the spring and the summer, you start seeing dogs in the cars. Mm -hmm. People are traveling with their animals. They like to take them out for a ride, go get ice cream, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. What kind of rules do we have about that? Because I could imagine that's somewhat of a hindrance. It, it's, it's a very serious issue that we're going to be facing here shortly, and we already started getting calls. Uh, it's not a, like today. It's in the, the low 60s, upper mm -hmm, 50s. It's, mm -hmm. it's sunny out, but it's cool. The mm -hmm. humidity's low. So an animal that's left in a vehicle for a few minutes really doesn't, isn't at risk. But even today, on a sunny day, with the windows not even all the way up, if you left your animal in the vehicle, I guarantee you, you go into that vehicle 20, 30 minutes later, it's very warm in that vehicle, mm -hmm. and that's one thing that a lot of people don't understand. It doesn't take any time at all you know, on a sunny day for a car to heat up, even in cooler weather. Mm -hmm. But 
compounded by summer heat, you know, when oh we started gosh. getting the 70s and 80s and even 90s, what we find is a lot of people will go to the store, the supermarket, mm -hmm. and they'll go in to get one or two things. Mm -hmm. And then they see somebody inside or mm -hmm. they start getting their shopping list together and, yeah. well, we need this, we need that. Yeah. And all of a sudden, 20, 30 minutes has gone by, and we're getting calls about these big dogs and vehicles. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, within 10 minutes on an 80 degree day, it could be 120 in that vehicle. Oh my gosh. Because what, what your vehicle is, is one big magnifying glass. Even with tinted windows, that radiation from the sun is going in, and mm -hmm. it's not getting out. Even with the windows cracked, and not enough heat is mm -hmm. escaping to give your animal any type, type of relief. So what we try to tell everybody is, you know, unless you're going to the vet's office, unless you're driving to the vet or to the park to mm -hmm. play with your dog, we suggest leave your pet at home, mm -hmm. you know, because things happen to everybody. And unfortunately, your animal's the one that suffers for it in those situations. Yeah, well, and again, good point. I mean, as much as we like to have, you know, they're like children to us. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, I know our pets are, so. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and that's a real problem for us. It puts us in a very bad situation because, mm -hmm. you know, one of the animal control officers get a call, a call to the mall or to a, just some Walmart parking lot or what have you. And, you know, you know, it's very hard to find the person that owns that vehicle. I mean, yeah. you can, you can have, you know, you end up having to talk to the management. They have to page people in the stores. It's, it's just, a, it's a big um, uh, situation for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just, uh, he, Martin's right, we just can't stress enough, this time, especially this time of year, please leave your animals at home. Yeah, that, that makes good sense. And it, you know, it's kind of, not a waste of time, but it obviously you have other mm -hmm. jobs to do with mm -hmm. this whole list of mm -hmm. things than, than tracking down one person right. for a dog in a car. So, well, you mentioned a little bit ago about uh, other animals. You said something about a raccoon mm -hmm. and possibly a skunk. So. I guess Joplin has a few of those running around. <laughs> Believe it or not, we probably have more wild animals in the city than there is outside the city. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> and, and the reason is, is you got food, uh -huh. you got harborage, mm -hmm. and what you have is no predators to take these animals out. Right. In the wild, you know, baby raccoons, baby possums, mm -hmm. uh, skunks, you know, would be taken out by coyotes and other animals. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that predation in the city. Mm -hmm. And we've got drains, we got sewers, we got sheds with nice big crawl spaces underneath them. And you have it's, homes. we, we got have homes <laughs> for them. And yeah. the food is the trash and, and everything else, cat food, people oh, put cat yes. food out. They put dog food out. We'll talk about that in a minute too. Yeah, and, and that's one of the reasons why we have such a, a wild animal population in the city, which I can connect back to the rabies risk. Mm -hmm. You know, when you've got the raccoons, the skunks, the possums eating out of the same food dish as your cat or dog, that means your pet is coming in contact eventually with one of these animals. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're, we're so adamant about people making sure their animals are current on the rabies shots. Mm -hmm. Well, so if someone sees an animal, you know, mm -hmm. that we maybe have a predator in the neighborhood that keeps coming back, keeps kind of getting into the trash or whatever, how do they get rid of it? We do uh, have a trap loan program. Mm -hmm. uh, the way our, our program works is we will bring you out a trap on Mondays mm -hmm. and we'll pick it up on Friday. Uh, the person requesting the trap is required to watch and bait the trap with whatever bait is necessary for the certain type of mm -hmm. critter you're looking for. Um, and we will come and remove the animal uh, whenever we're called when the person realizes that they have trapped mm -hmm. something. So why Monday through Friday, that kind of situation? Due to the fact we only have three officers okay. working. We, uh, we basically have uh, one officer that works the weekend and he is so busy doing just right. the normal animal calls yeah. throughout uh, or during the weekend that he doesn't have time to check the traps because we'll set up the 20 traps sometimes and wow. those we will check them on a daily basis even though the the person that is requesting the trap is also required to do so we want to make sure that even if it is a raccoon or possum we don't want to leave it in the trap all day long or for two to three days so it, it takes time to run across town to check all these traps so by setting the trap on Monday and picking it up on Friday, what we found is that we became more productive on, on trapping these animals that people have been complaining about. Also, it gives us more time to do our normal duties that we have throughout the week. Well, that makes sense. If someone needs to contact an animal control officer, um, I know there are certain numbers, and I think uh, if the control room has those numbers, we'd like to put those on. But during business hours, what number is it that they call? They can call the, just the health department number. Oh. Uh, during Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, business hours, uh, animal control most of the time is dispatched out of our office. Uh -huh. We actually have uh, uh, radio uh, radios in the office and we can dispatch them by radio or by uh, the CAD system, the community computer and dispatching system. 
uh, but you can call 623-6122. That's mm -hmm. the health department number. Uh, uh, on weekends, after hours, mm -hmm. you can you can call that number, and you can eventually push a button to get you to the to the dis, dis central dispatch, or you can call the six two three three one three one number on weekends or after hours, and then uh, because a lot of times I think a lot of times people don't realize we do have animal control officers working weekends as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, now, and we do have an officer on call all the time for emergency situations. So if you get you know if you're out jogging at ten thirty at night and you get bit by a, a dog that's an emergency. And mm -hmm. when you call into one of these two numbers, uh, you can get to the dispatching system and, they'll, and they, they will dispatch an animal control officer to investigate that dog bite. So emergency type situations after hours. Because all dog bites need to be investigated, that's obviously. All animal bites. Yes, yes all animal yes. bites. Yes. Not okay. the only ones we, we don't really investigate is something like a gerbil or a mouse, small rodents. Mm -hmm. But anything, especially any wild animal, mm -hmm. uh, we, we definitely want to be notified. Uh, it is very important to understand that that even if an animal is you don't think is rabid, it can still be transmitting or shedding the virus, transmitting the disease, even if it's not showing any symptoms. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's very important with every animal bite we be notified, and at least we can investigate it, advise the victim of of what the risks are and what they need to do in that certain certain situation. Well. Um yeah, I hope no one's getting bit, but I know I know it does happen. I've yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll investigate on average uh, about 15 bites a month. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! So it does happen. You're like yeah. you said. Now, if someone's lost their pet, how do they you know how do they reclaim their pet? Do they call you first, or do they call the shelter, or how does that work? They need to contact the Joplin Humane Society. Any animal, dog or cat, we pick up will be taken there, uh, okay. and that's their best way of finding their animal. And we also suggest. Even if they call out there and the people out there say they don't think they have it, we suggest they go out and look. There's so many different staff members that work there. The staff member that took the phone call may not have been the one to check in the animal. Mm -hmm. So we recommend that if you are missing a pet, you can call, but we recommend you go out there and check for yourself to see. Right, and I know, I mean, again, like I said, pets are like our children, and mm -hmm. I think that people would be really willing to go do that. So I think that's wonderful. Well, I think we need to wrap it up. We're getting close to the 30 minute mark. Is there anything specific, any other key issues we really haven't hit on as far as animal control during this time of well, year? You know, we, we just really encourage people to have their animals spayed or neutered mm -hmm. and get those rabies shots done. And, and something that's new to our, to our department, we do have a, a spay neuter assistance program now. If you're income eligible, you, you may be un income eligible to have some assistance with that. We can provide a voucher up to $50 towards the cost of that. Wow. So if somebody uh, has a question about that they can simply call our health department number and we'll be happy to give them the information about that. Okay, well that's that's a great way to close is that we have, we're assisting them in all sorts of ways. So well, I really appreciate it, Dan and Mark. You guys were great. Um, this concludes our episode of Joplin Insider. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we plan to bring you more shows about the city of Joplin and different services we provide in months to come. If you have any ideas, please contact me at the city. I'm Lynn Onstott with the Joplin Insider. Thank you for watching.